Welcome to the first of our conversations with the candidates for the presidency of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. At CGD, we hope to contribute to the EBRD presidency election process in the best way we can by offering this opportunity for the candidates to discuss their visions for the future of the bank. It is therefore a great pleasure to welcome the first of the candidates, Professor Piercarlo Padoan, former Italian Minister of Economy and Finances and current member of the Italian Parliament. Professor Padoan, welcome, and thank you for agreeing to take part in this conversation. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to discuss views about the bank. Super. So let me start by asking you what you think the strengths and the weaknesses are of the EBRD as we stand today in the midst of this unprecedented global health and economic crisis. Well, the bank beyond the economic crisis and even before has been going through a number of other crises and has by definition been dealing with transition elements. And this is where strengths and weaknesses of the, of the bank come up very strongly. Let me start with the strengths. Uh, the strength is related to its, the original mandate of the bank, which calls for a partnership between EU and non-EU countries to support transition in uh, European, in European uh, economies. And to do that, taking into account at the same time general principles such as bringing the private sector closer towards market behavior, and at the same time taking into account country-specific recommendations, which have to do with the way economic institutions function in an economy. So its strength has been the enormous flexibility to take into account specific situations, but at the same time doing that with, uh, with general principles. One example is the transition gap. The transition gap is a way to pin down the distance that the country has to uh, complete before being able to exploit the full benefits of market economies. And this has been a strength also given the fact that the bank, like other international institutions, has gone through two major crises, the European sovereign crisis of a decade ago, and of course the current crisis. This flexibility will be extremely important in going forward. So this is a strength, and I, in my mandate, if I were ever to get one, I would work to strengthen the mandate and to exploit the benefits of the bank. Let me mention weaknesses. I can uh, mention especially one weakness, which is, you know, in a, in, a, in a word, communication. The bank has been extremely successful in helping transition countries go making progress and moving towards the so-called graduation. But this has possibly not been recognized fully in the public policy debate, and not because the bank wants to be thanked for the, what, the, what the purpose is, but because the, the bank activity represents a clear success story case which can be replicated and which needs to be adopted by other countries if they need to do so. So more communication, more explanation, even to the broader public, what DBRD is about. Thank you. And what is your vision for the future of the EBRD? And, and particularly, how would you use this period to start thinking about the shape of things to come? My vision is to exploit these uh, benefits that I've just discussed and to go through a renowned activity towards the transition mechanism. Uh, of course, we cannot but take into consideration that the COVID imposes a huge transition, not only to countries that were in a transition phase before the crisis, but to many other countries as well. And this is, uh, of course, a case to which at least diffusion, the policy approach that the EBRD has followed in, in transition could be useful to other countries. Let me give you one specific example, which draws back also to my previous working experience at the OECD. One of the elements of strength of an overall public policy approach is to combine the benefits of appropriate macroeconomic, financial and structural policies. Now, we need to understand how the benefits of structural reforms and structural transformation translate into growth benefits for the country that adopts them. And the obvious uh, 
answer to that question is this is true investment. So if you have an effective investment mechanism, and by investment I mean both public but especially private investment mechanism, that is the best way through which a country can benefit from structural reforms and translate investment into sustainable growth. So this would be one of the elements in which what we know from successful transition cases in other countries can help the EBRD improve its effectiveness, but at the same time show the broader public what the EBRD can offer in terms of good practice and experience for other countries uh, in very difficult situations face, such as the COVID crisis we are right now struggling with. And just following on from that, um, if, if you are chosen to serve as president of the EBRD, what would be the top two or three things against which you would like your term to be judged? Well, first of all, uh, I would say to demonstrate that the EBRD can provide useful su support to the uh, exit we will have to all face from the COVID crisis. So let me state the obvious. The COVID crisis has said that we need to restart growing, but we need to do that with different model in mind. This is in a way was clear even before the COVID crisis, when for instance in Europe, the Commission highlighted the need to deal with the twin transition towards sustainable economy, including green sustainability and the digital economy. Now, my view is that the COVID crisis has accelerated the need to, uh, to move towards the twin transition. So we, we need to rethink our policy overall schemes in that perspective. And so uh, I would like uh, whoever takes up this mandate to be remembered as one who has successfully exploited the so-called benefits of a crisis. Remember the well-known saying, never waste a good crisis to improve the standard of living, which brings me, of, of population, which brings me to another key word which I'd like to introduce in the discussion, which is inclusion. Sustainable economies and societies must also be very inclusive. And we have uh, increasing evidence that social, more social inclusion uh, strengthens the economy, while of course at the same time, stronger economy uh, provides ways to deal with inclusion, which is both uh, social inclusion, gender inclusion, and other ways of dealing with that. So we, we need to rethink how market institutions can be redesigned and uh, re-implemented to deal with this big challenge we're facing. And this challenge will be showing its negative impact in the next few months. So it, it's, it's, let's be very cognizant of the fact that it's not over yet. Sometimes you hear people saying the crisis is over. This unfortunately is not the case. So, so given this different model, uh, do, do you foresee any short-term and long-term changes specifically to the bank's operations and activities? Well, first of all, let me say that, uh, as everyone can check, the shock of the COVID crisis has been huge and has impacted on the sustainability of many institutions. From that point of view, I understand that this has not been the case of the EBRD in the sense that the, the bank has so far fared well with the shocks coming from the crisis. But at the same time, uh, looking at the issue of what to do with the resources and what should an institutions like the bank do with this, this point of view. My uh, one element which I take from the initial evidence of the COVID crisis is that in the emergency response, inevitably to some extent, policymakers and countries have used a lot of resources just to provide defense against the wave. Uh, so this has gone to some extent to the detriment of being more selective. I know it's extremely difficult to be more selective in crisis. In my government experience, this has been the case for some time. You would like to put the money exactly where it's needed and exactly in the amount that it's needed with the instruments that are needed. The EBRD is able to do that, but of course, if the crisis is so large, so uh, so fast, so quick to hit you right on the on the head, Sometimes governments do not have the time. 
but once the initial shock wave has been absorbed and possibly stopped and, and uh, sustained for a moment, then it's time to go to the counterattack in a way and to develop transition strategies which need to be some uh, massive in terms of resources, but also as qualitative, as selective as possible. And by selective, I mean selective in terms of, for instance, which sectors should be prioritized to, to obtain support and which should, in other, in, other, in other cases, not be supported because they don't need support. Let's not forget, and this is a point which has not been very much in the policy debate so far, that one of the features of the COVID crisis has been changing the relative implicit prices of sectors and goods. Some, let me be less cryptic, some sectors have gained out of the aftermath of, after of the crisis. One is being the web industry in a broad sense, because we are now dealing a lot more than before with web instruments, which is good, which is accelerating the digital transition, but which also signals that some industries have to some extent benefited from the crisis because demand for the services have increased. While other sectors, and the obvious example that comes to my mind in Italy, but also in other countries is tourism, are devastated by the crisis. So the issue is, what do we do with the money? Money is not a problem in the immediate sense, but will be, again, a, a budget constraints in terms of accumulating debt in the future so that governments must be more uh, careful in allocating the resources because at some stage we will need to deal with recovery of the huge debt that's being accumulated because of the crisis. So the challenge ahead of us, ahead of governments, ahead of institutions is really uh, huge, but I'm confident that the bank will respond effectively to this challenge. And talking about sectors, um... If we think a little bit about the climate uh, agenda, how, how would you make sure that the climate agenda remains front and center of the EBRD's investments in the COVID era? Well, first of all, uh, we all know, and it's worth repeating, that the green agenda of the EBRD, the Get Green uh, agenda, has been launched already a few years back and it's proving to be extremely successful. So this is the case in which the crisis is an accelerator. Accelerator in the sense that since we need to change our business, our economic and social model, because green is about the economy and about society, about behavior, then we need to do it faster. And being, again, uh, raising the point I was mentioning earlier, being more selective. So uh, there is one aspect which is how do we generate more incentive for investment in the green sector? And this is related to the point I was making, that in order to benefit from structural reforms, economies must invest, must uh, private sector investment must be directed to incentives, uh, which are, can be of, of many, na of several nature, uh, be directed towards the, the, uh, the green economy. The other side, of the story is, of course, green finance, which we know has been a successful industry so far. And I think that the, the, the bank will have to look more carefully into the matching of the growth of a green finance industry with the green industry system, which needs to be financed. So this is one a specific aspect for which a private sector will do most of the job but private sector will need to have some guidance about where the long-term perspective and resources will be allocated. So again, this is a role for which an institution like the EBRD is extremely well equipped to deal with, and I'm convinced that this is again an opportunity that should not be wasted. Um, you mentioned uh, inclusion um, in, in a previous response. Um, the EBRD has a gender strategy. Do you think it's being implemented well enough, or do you think that it should be doing more to pay attention to gender, both in its external investments and in its own internal policies and administration? Well, gender is a key problem, a key issue, a key challenge, and a key opportunity. Uh, to be frank, I think more can be done at DBRD to internalize and mainstream the gender agenda into the policies. 
this is because uh, this is a, one component of the inclusion agenda, which is a broader agenda, which needs to be uh, introduced. And also because it is economically interesting, so to speak, to have a gender agenda. Uh, let me let me try to art, uh, articulate the point. First of all, and this is uh, what what is probably one of the dangers Europe is is running against. Uh, once we exit the emergency phase of the COVID crisis, there will be a tendency to more divergence rather than convergence if policy is not active enough. This divergence policy, this divergence trend, sorry, could be extremely negative for those who are parts of, uh, are excluded. So the gender exclusion could be accelerated by divergence because uh, fragile segments of society will be more relevant, unfortunately, if policies do not adjust. So from that point of view, uh, I think that there is a lot of work to do to putting together the economics of gender exclusion, the sociology of gender exclusion, and the finance of gender exclusion. Again, finding appropriate instruments for uh, people that are victims of gender exclusion to add the resources to be not only to uh, be included in the economic system, but to contribute. Uh, let me just let me just give you an example which uh, comes from my country once again, and apologies for using it. Uh, family is a key policy in which some countries fare better than others. And now economists are discovering, maybe a bit too late, or at least some economists are discovering, that having a inefficient gender policy, a little support for families. Uh, damages the whole economy, not just those families that are excluded from the benefits of growth. In times of crisis, this is especially important. And this goes back to the point I was making earlier about being more selective in support. One way of dealing with gender inclusion is to recognize that uh, some segments of the population also related to gender are more severely hit than others in terms of benefits of growth in terms of benefit of uh, structural measures. Let me give you one example. I mentioned family. Let me mention education. Education opportunities, other things equal, have a gender bias, unfortunately, which needs to be addressed and needs to be uh, addressed and targeted by appropriate resources. This is, again, why once we are out of the emergency phase of the COVID crisis, we need to be more qualitative and selective. Moving towards a longer term horizon helps us to do that because we have more time to uh, design and implement investment programs that go in that direction. But this need, needs to be part of the strategy from the start, from the beginning, and not just an additional chapter in the story of uh, country strategies, for instance. <clears throat> So do you believe that the EBRD should set targets for measuring uh, the implementation of its um, both its external gender strategy and its internal strategy? Well, measuring impact uh, of any policy, not just gender strategy, is useful. Uh, we can, uh, policymakers on a daily basis use indicators of what is happening in terms of public finance, in terms of structural performance, in terms of growth. Uh, I am certainly in favor, being an economist by training, of knowing a bit more before saying a bit more. So indicators of success are extremely important. And in my experience in, with international organizations, including the OECD, but before that, including the IMF, one of the points that were raised initially, and I'm talking about uh, uh, what, 15 to 20 years ago, one of the questions that were raised was, are we sure that your policy recommendation works? And, sometimes, and many years ago, the answer was, we do not know. Now, if you ask the same answer, uh, same question, sorry, to uh, international organizations about specific policies, are you sure that those policies work? You tend to get much more precise and specific uh, 
questions. The issue is therefore, yes, we need more information, more measurement of impact. The measurement of impact, however, is not that easy to say, state the obvious. But again, let's use the crisis as an opportunity. Let's agree among policymakers, among international organizations that we need metrics to deal with gender inequality, but also other inequalities that may emerge uh, we are not aware of as a consequence of the crisis. And since we're mentioning the COVID crisis, let me say that this COVID crisis has changed the world also for another reason, for raising awareness that we must know how pandemics eventually break out and diffuse. We need to, uh, ex epidemiologists tell us that we, would, we will live with pandemics in the future more than we do now. Possibly we will be more aware of the pandemic's risk. And this is essential to provide uh, investment in sectors that protect us against pandemics. So one of the key messages is, yes, we need to know more about preventing risk of pandemics including its social consequences, including gender consequences, but also as a guide to structural uh, programs. For instance, in, in, in many countries, there is the awareness that healthcare spending needs to be up, upgraded significantly because the threats to health are much more acute than we thought they were a few months ago. Now, moving on to the EBRD's countries of operation. What is your view of the EBRD's proposed expansion into Sub-Saharan Africa? And what do you think is needed to enable the EBRD to be really effective in that region? Well, since you mentioned Sub-Saharan Africa, let me take this opportunity to thank Sir Suma Chakrabarti, whose mandate has just expired, because among other things, he was the one who started work in this area and opened a new a frontier, I would say, in the EBRD geography ex expansion. I think that there is a potential role for the EBRD in the region. This potential role is particularly interesting for EU countries that consider the region as a priority region. I think that there is a possibility and scope to consider in a selective and uh, specific way some countries in the region to be considered for, for intervention. This has to be done carefully, uh, also because in designing transition strategies, to go back to my one of my initial points, we need to work with general approaches, such as the EBRD tradition confirms, but also take into consideration country-specific situations. So this is possible. There is another condition which I think is extremely important in this care in this case that cooperation with other uh, multilateral development institutions like regional banks should be strengthened so that the EBRD, if it were to provide support, it would provide support according to its comparative advantage in terms of flexibility of its business model, but also draw on the experience of other institutions and work together in the division of labor. So this is the way to move forward, given the options, but also given the need, the fact that we, we need to deal with other countries as well. And speaking of cooperation, just thinking more broadly now about the European development finance architecture, uh, and I have no doubt you're aware of the proposals that came out of the Wise Persons Group on the future of the European development finance architecture, and in particular, the debate around the roles of the EBRD and the European Investment Bank. So what are your views on the future institutional co composition of European development finance? And how do you see the role of the EBRD evolving in particular in relation to the EIB? Well, first of all, the time is right for, to provide uh, an assessment of the, this, this important area which is also very complicated and let me say that I very much appreciated the contribution provided by the wise person uh, group and the report they uh, issued uh, not very uh, uh, quite recently. Well 
I think that there is a need to, uh, this is one a classic area where institutions should find ways to collaborate more effectively. Uh, from the point of view of the specific case you mentioned, Europe needs to, let me say, develop a narrative about Europe's view on development finance, especially in, in neighboring countries. And once this narrative is developed, then there are the basis for asking the next question, which is who should do what in this agreed common narrative? Uh, I'm a strong believer in the notion of comparative advantage. I've worked a lot in my academic career in international trade, so I know how important comparative advantage is. And this is true also of institutions. Uh, institutions evolve in a situation where multilateralism is under threat for a number of reasons. I think that the benefits of multilateralism are way are larger than possible shortcomings of multilateralism. So I think this is the case where institutions should cooperate exactly to exploit the benefits of multilateralism and to do that through the principle of comparative advantage. Now, as far as the EEIB and EBRD are concerned, I see these institutions two strong players that interact among themselves, between themselves, but also interact with other institutions, including other multilateral development banks, but also including about with uh, national development banks, which, which are in cases very important, big players, also in the international arena. So my reaction to the point is, Let's recognize that comparative advantages are an important guiding principle. Let's understand on how this can be exploited in terms of common governance. And let's uh, strengthen each one on its own area of advantage. Let's deepen this comparative advantage and let's see where the uh, over overlapping can be eliminated if it is a cost. Uh, given this, uh, I take this opportunity to remind that when I was finance minister of Italy and Italy had the G7 presidency, as a finance minister, I supported strongly a rethinking of the multilateral development bank system because one has the impression that needs to be uh, nailed down with hard facts that sometimes there is opportunity for filling gaps on the one hand and avoiding duplication on the other hand. So let's take this general approach to multilateral organizations and structures to the case we we're discussing. I'm convinced that we can come up with a stronger European system of uh, international financial architecture. Thank you. And, and finally, um, can you tell us something about your own career and background and how your experiences have shaped you? to be an effective president of the EBRD? Well, thank you for this very personal question. I'll be happy to give uh, some further information about my career. I start my career as an academic, and I've been professor of economics in a number of universities, including outside Italy. I am currently just retired from being a professor of economics uh, at the University of Rome, where I graduated a few, a few years ago. My areas of interest have been threefold. One has been uh, econometric modeling, which uh, was very time, time absorbing and very painful, but also very uh, interesting. The other thing, the other area where I worked a lot has been international economics, including international trade and international knowledge competitiveness. And finally, I worked a lot on, in, on an area which in the 1980s was known as international political economy. That is to say, to understand how international organizations evolve, how they reflect country-specific interests, group-specific interests, and how they can interact to provide global public goods. This area of expertise, I think, has been ob obliterated for some time, has been kept in the drawer for some time. Now it's time to take it back on the table because it provides useful insights. Having said that, I started working more on the policy area in the late 1990s. I was advisor, economic advisor to a couple of prime ministers in Italy, especially in international issues such as EU relations, G7 and G8. At the time, there was a G8 
policies. Then I uh, spent a few years at the International Monetary Fund as executive director for the uh, Italian constituency. And I had the opportunity to see from there and help there the introduction of the euro, which was a major structural change and was really a situation where things, where the role of Europe was highlighted. By the way, I had the opportunity of living through some major financial crisis, including the 2001 Argentinian financial crisis, which was very severe at the time and which proved, however, how the resilience of international institutions are a key element to provide support and development and, and strong development in the international area. I then moved to the OECD initially as Deputy Secretary General and then also as Chief Economist. Again, at the OECD, I witnessed a major crisis because I was there as Chief Economist when the 2008 2009 uh, financial crisis broke out. And so this is an area where I especially develop the the notion that uh, policymakers need to do to make the best use of what they can with their policy instruments they have at their disposal. So this is where macroeconomic, both fiscal and monetary policy must interact in better ways to with structural reforms, a point which has now become become accepted broadly, but which at the time uh, was not so much. Let me mention one point, if I may, in this respect, that at the time of the big financial crisis, as, as you may recall, the G20 at leaders level was established, and the G20 uh, included a number of emerging economies, such as the big players, like, such, as, such as China, such as Russia, such as Brazil, which initially did not want the uh, OECD as an international organization to participate in the meetings because they said that the OECD was not including in membership the emerging economies. Why am I mentioning this? Because eventually by showing that international organizations can provide useful advice, be, the, be it financial or non-financial, this is a benefit for all countries, be they member or non-member states. And so this now the OECD is a fully accepted and welcome member of the G20 gatherings and is providing extremely important inputs. So this has been also a very important element in my career, which I take along with me, interaction of different policy instruments in a one coordinated set and a strong role that international organizations can play in fostering international cooperation and addressing crisis, something which I hope will be remembered when we take a stock of the COVID crisis, which in my view would require much more international cooperation. And finally, of course, my experience as a finance minister has been extremely uh, important for, for my knowledge, hopefully has been useful for my country. And I would like to uh, take this opportunity for thanking all the inter inter Italian institutions for giving me this opportunity, but also with one element of substance, which again, I think is extremely useful when looking at the BRD. Italy, uh, when I became finance minister, was just exiting a severe recession and was lacking uh, growth. And so the strategy of the government became uh, a, a twin strategy of dealing with the effects of the financial crisis, which has been particularly severe in, against balance sheets, against uh, retail savers, and the role of structural reforms. Italy badly needs structural reforms to raise its potential rate of growth. And one of the difficulties that it is associated with structural reform is that sometimes there is not enough urgency in the policy debate about structural reforms. Why am I mentioning this? not just to, again, speak only about Italy, but because I think we are now globally facing a same, similar challenge. We need to feel the urgency of structural reforms so that they can contribute to exiting the COVID consequences in a, in a way that is useful for the individual countries and for the country, group countries as a whole. Again, DBRD has a unique expertise in how to combine structural reforms action with macroeconomic policies 
for the benefits of the specific countries, but also for the spillover benefits. One element which I'd like to stress in concluding my, my answer, spillovers are much more important than we tend to think. We may be seeing a, a phase of globalization which is more interior looking rather than exterior looking, but spillovers do remain and we, we need to harness the benefits of interdependence while dealing with the negative consequences of interdependence, which are of course there, and pandemics is certainly one of those. So I, I would say that in my different country career experiences, I accumulated a little bit of knowledge, which I hope could be useful to DBRD as well. Thank you very much, Professor Padon. Uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to um, add anything further, anything you think we haven't covered, which you would like to to express. Well, uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the Italian government for having uh, uh, offered me the opportunity to be a candidate for this very important position. Uh, whatever the result will be, I, uh, am, I will be happy to respect, of course, the uh, indication of the EU, of the, of the EBRD membership, which is an extremely rich membership. And let me say that looking at its membership, it's so, it's a number and its diversity. One come, one element comes to mind, which I offer as a concluding thought, that diversity is a benefit for those who, who participate in joint institutions, organizations. Joint organizations are, correct, are successful for two reasons. One, when they have shared common values that are strong and accepted, and two, when they uh, exploit their country specificities as a benefit for others to learn or to accept lessons from others. So diversity uh, is the other side of integration and it's a benefit, and EBRD is an instrument to uh, harness the benefits of integration because it's based on common principles. So this is a, a, an exciting institution we're talking about. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Padon, for your time, for agreeing to set out your vision for the EBRT. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.